morning, everybody. Hey, I, I kind of been wrestling with this this morning, just sitting down here worshiping and wrestling with whether I should take time to talk through this because I really feel like the Holy Spirit was putting it on my heart. It really has nothing to do with today's message. and It's probably going to mean we're going to be a few minutes late getting out of here, but I've kind of learned over 30 years of ministry when the Holy Spirit lays something on your heart, you better share it. And so uh, just sitting down there listening to those songs that we were singing this morning about a God who is faithful, a God who never lets us down, a God who can be counted on. And I hear those words, but then I I look at the reality of the circumstances of our lives. And sometimes I find myself asking, you know, where is that God? Where are his promises? And then I realize God's promise is not a problem-free life. In fact, God's promise is that we will have trouble. In this world, we will have trouble. His promise, His faithfulness, the way He never lets us down is by being with us, walking with us, giving us the strength to walk through those storms and surrounding us with people who can help us when we can't even hardly take our next step. And I was thinking about this this morning, as Rick talked about when he was welcoming us, like sometimes you just can't even sing the songs because of what you're going through. And I remember for months, months after the loss of our oldest son, Terry and I sitting here on this front row, literally unable to verbalize that praise, unable to sing those promises and realizing that it was you, our church family, who were singing praises for us when we couldn't sing them ourselves. It's kind of like if you're familiar with NASCAR racing, this thing called drafting, where you get right behind another car and it just pulls you along. We drafted on the praise of our church family for months until God began to heal our heart and we could sing these songs Again, And I don't know who this is for this morning. I don't know why the Spirit laid this on my heart. But I hope that whatever you're going through, whatever you're dealing with, that you will allow yourself to draft off of this church family. That you know you are welcomed and loved and cared for whatever you're dealing with. So that's what the Spirit put on my heart. I figured it's for somebody, so I hope you'll be encouraged today. Y'all won't be clapping when it's 10 after. (laughs) Well, you can see we're in week five of our journey through the New Testament book of 1 Timothy. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, turn, click, get over to 1 Timothy chapter 5. That's what we're going to be digging into today. And if you don't have a Bible or a Bible app, you can find notes for today's message on the Cedar Creek Church app. For those of you who are having your 4th of July trip at the beach or lake or whatever, tuning in, you can find a link to today's message notes on whatever platform you're on so everybody can follow along. Now, for those of you who may be new or you've just been out for the last couple of weeks and you're not kind of with us so far on this First Timothy, let me give you just a little background and a little review for those of us who have been here. First Timothy is one of three books in the New Testament that are known as pastoral epistles. All three of these books are personal letters written by the Apostle Paul to two pastors who were leading New Testament churches that Paul had started. Two of the letters are written to a pastor named Timothy, one to a pastor by the name of Titus. And when Paul writes his first letter to Timothy, Timothy is actually pastoring a church in the ancient city of Ephesus. And we discovered Ephesus was not only a huge metropolitan city, the second biggest city in the Roman Empire at the time, but it was also a very diverse city because it was a major shipping port. Uh, Ephesus was kind of a melting pot of cultures, races, languages, religions. It was a real eclectic town. And so apparently what had happened is sometime after Paul started this church in Ephesus and then moved on, 
some of that culture, some of that other religion started to seep in to the church in Ephesus. And so Timmy gets in there to kind of be the pastor. And so when Paul writes this letter to Timothy, he's not writing it because Timothy is some young whippersnapper still wet behind the ears pastor who's in over his head at this big, influential, a little bit jacked up church. Paul writes this letter for two reasons. One, to encourage Timothy to stay in the fight and fight the good fight. But primarily, he writes it to give Timothy some practical advice to make sure that the church in Ephesus keeps the main thing the main thing, that they don't drift off of the mission, the essential nature of why they, and by extension, why we as a church exist in the world. And Paul states what that main thing for the church is at the very beginning of the letter, 1 Timothy 1 chapter 5. Paul says, the aim of our charge, our purpose, our mission as a church is love. And not the kind of love the culture talks about, but real love, love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. In other words, Paul's saying it's all about the gospel. This amazing story of God's love expressed through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And the role of the church is to protect the gospel, the purity of the gospel within the church family, and to reflect the gospel well to the people outside of God's family. And so the goal of 1 Timothy, the filter through which we have to read everything in here, is to make sure that the church of Ephesus and 2,000 years later, the church at Cedar Creek remains a love-focused, gospel-centric church. Or as Paul puts it in chapter 6, young Timothy, guard the deposit. Protect this deposit, this gospel message that transformed your life and can transform the lives of people around you. And so that's kind of what the first Timothy is all about. Two of the biggest mistakes we tend to make when we study or read the book of Timothy. One is to see it as simply an operations manual for the church. That Paul just writes a great letter with policies and procedures as to how the church should operate, function, the leadership structure, like it's a really good constitution and bylaws for the church. And while, yes, Paul gives great practical advice for structure and function and leadership in the church. If that's all you see it as, you're really going to miss the heart of the message. The second mistake we tend to make is to assume that what is written in 1 Timothy, everything written in 1 Timothy applies directly to every church, every church that's ever existed or ever will exist. In other words, it's this idea that I can just take this letter Paul writes to Timothy about the church at Ephesus, just cut and paste it, drag it through 2,000 years of history and culture, and just apply it carte blanche on the church today. And that happens a lot in churches. And yes, yes, there are principles and truths that still apply to the church today. But this letter was written specifically for the church at Ephesus and the issues that they were dealing with. And besides that, 1 Timothy is not all-inclusive for instructions on how to run a church. Remember, Paul and Timothy had traveled and worked together for years. Paul had been his mentor in the ministry. So there are a lot of things that Paul knew. Timothy didn't need to have a letter. He already knew them. And so not everything's in here. You just can't cut and paste it and apply it to a church in Aiken, South Carolina in 2021. So you say, well, why are we studying it? Why are we wasting our summer going through it? Here's why. Because it is full of God-given truths and God-given principles that are relevant for and apply to the church today. And not just for the church, but for each one of us as individuals within the church. 
Like three weeks ago, we were looking at Paul's instructions about worship for the church at Ephesus, and there was a list of what you could wear and who could speak and who couldn't speak, right? And what we discovered is it wasn't about dress code for church or about what gender is better to teach or speak. It wasn't about that. It was about for that church making sure that every time the church gathered, it was about protecting and reflecting the gospel, not the culture or the world. And then last week, we looked at that great list of qualifications for leaders within the church, of pastors and elders and deacons, and saw this incredible list of character traits that are required for those who would lead in the church, but they are desired in everyone who calls themselves a part of the church. So it is relevant. And so I want you to think through that today as we jump into Paul's instructions to Timothy about relationships within the church, because that's what chapter 5 is all about, how we as members of the church should treat each other, how we should connect and relate to each other in a way that protects and reflects the gospel. And so as we unpack chapter 5, we're going to see three truths about relationships within the church. You might want to write these down. First one is that relationships within the church should be built on honor and respect. How we relate to each other within the church has to be built on honor and respect for each other. If you're familiar at all with the New Testament, you know the church is often described as a family, that we are brothers and sisters that what connects us is not simply a set of shared beliefs, but a truth that we belong to each other like a family. And it's because we are to have that level of connection within the church, it demands that we honor and respect each other even when we disagree, even when we're wrong. Notice right off the bat, the first part of verse 1. Paul says to Timmy, do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. That word rebuke literally means to correct by confrontation. To come to someone and say, you are wrong about this. Now remember, Part of the reason Paul wrote this letter is because some of the teaching elders in the church at Ephesus were teaching things that were not biblically accurate, that weren't in line with the apostles' teaching. So these are older men, older than Timothy. And Paul says, Timothy, you got to confront them on their junk, but then look at what he says. You got to do it as if they were your father. You're also going to see in chapter 6 when we get there, he tells them, you've got to deal with people in the church who are wealthy and are depending on their wealth. They've built up all this wealth, and that's what their hope's in. He says, you've got to rebuke them. Guess who the wealthy people were in that culture? Older men. They were the ones who had time and ability to establish wealth. So Paul's saying, look, you've got to confront these untruths. These people are out of the way, but you've got to talk to them like you were talking to your own father. I remember 10 years ago, my parents were living in Greenville in the home there, and my mom's health started to deteriorate. It actually started when she fell in the middle of the night and broke a hip. And so she had surgery, fixed that, and she was rehabbing that and getting really strong, and she fell and broke the other hip. And it just became apparent that she could no longer live in a home in Greenville. She needed next level of care. She needed assisted living. And so, you know, I have four siblings, and we all got together. And it just made sense because I have more children than any of my other siblings. And because most of my kids live here in Aiken with their spouses, we just had a better uh, group, a stronger group of people here in Aiken. So we had my mom. Uh, she got into an assisted living. It was right next to where our house our family's house is. So we were able to be there and care for her. But my dad was convinced that she was going to get better, and so he wanted to stay at the house in Greenville. And he just, he wasn't ready to give that up. And, you know, even when it became apparent that mom is never going to be able to go back to independent living, he kind of dug his heels in. And I got it. 
Man, they'd been in, in Greenville in, in that area for 60 plus, 70 years, I think. And, you know, they had this great house, this great relationship, neighbors, their church family. He just was not willing to let go of that, even though the right thing would have been for him to come and move into an independent living apartment near my mom. And I remember just having to sit down and have that conversation with my dad. A godly man that I love and respect, but just knowing he was in the wrong. And so that conversation was truth, but it was covered with couched in honor and respect. And Paul says that church is how we speak to and treat older men in God's church. But it's not just us old guys. Look at the rest of verse 1 and verse 2. Paul says you got to treat younger men like you treat your brother and older women like mothers and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Let me ask you, those of you with siblings, how do you treat and interact with your siblings? You're probably thinking, well, it depends on which sibling you're talking about, right? Yeah, but in general, you know, how do you relate? My assumption is it's much less formal than how you interact with parents, right? It's a little more relaxed. There's a lot of give and take, right? We kind of, you know, push each other. Like when I was young, I remember I had three older brothers. They abused me verbally, physically. They could call me. They could make fun of the fact that I had a lisp. They could do all of that. But you let somebody outside the family pick on their little brother, right? They're like ready to fight. I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense. They, they're not nearly as bad. But that's kind of how we treat our siblings. But I think at the heart, of how we interact and relate to our siblings is this, transparency. We tend to be more transparent with our brothers and sisters, right? We, don't, we, we, let, our, we let the monster out sometime, you know, when it comes to them. We're not wearing masks. We're not playing pretend. And I think to some extent, Paul is saying, look, we need that kind of transparency with your peers within the church family. Now, because Timothy is a man, Paul offers a little caveat about how he should treat younger women. He says you got to do it with absolute purity. What does that mean? It means always with pure motives and a protective heart, right? He's saying you got you to treat them like you would treat your sister. And that's wise advice relevant for today. Because how many times do we turn on the news especially and see a pastor who has an affair with a secretary or a, a younger wife of a, a church staff member, and it's devastating. But that's not just true for pastors. It's true for all of us on how we treat members of the opposite sex within the church family. Now, I'm not saying you can't date or pursue a romantic relationship if you're single within the church family. What I am saying is you have to see members of the opposite sex not as objects of your desire, but as daughters and sons of the living God. Brothers and sisters in the faith first, right? So if we're going to treat each other with honor and respect within the church family, if we're going to have these kind of relationships, guess what? We actually got to be in relationship with each other. And with a church this size, it's going to require more than showing up with a couple of hundred other people for an hour on Sunday morning. You got to get connected. That's why home groups are vital to our church family because that's that place where you can be transparent and real. It is that place where you can honor and respect each other in spite of the fact that you vote differently or you have a different demographic or a different socioeconomic place. Those honest, open, authentic relationships with a few other people within the church family, they not only protect the purity of the gospel inside the church, but they reflect the gospel well to people outside the church. When people outside the church see us truly connecting like brothers and sisters, doing life together, in spite of our differences, in spite of the diversity that we have, they look at that and go, there's something bigger than just human beings. 
There's a higher power involved there. And besides, I know it looks like everybody outside the church and most of the people inside the church just want to fight and be disunified and divided. But can I tell you, in the heart of every human being is a desire to be connected in spite of our differences. And those kinds of relationships, they attract non-believers like a moth to a flame. I think that's what Jesus meant when he said in John 13, 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, love requires honor and respect in our relationships, just like it does in a family. Number two, the second thing we learn about relationships within the church is that they have to be built to truly help the marginalized. That seems weird when we think about it. the way we relate and treat each other has to be built in a way that truly helps the marginalized. Let me tell you how I got there. If you're familiar with the New Testament, especially letters to churches, there is a lot written about how the church treats the widows within the church family. Right? In fact, we saw last week in Acts chapter 6, the first and only church at that time in Jerusalem got so big and had so many widows in need that the whole leadership office of deacons was created to care for the needs of the widows in the church. And you look at chapter 5 of 1 Timothy, this important letter, the bulk of this chapter from verse 3 all the way to verse 16 is specifically about caring for widows within the church. It's a big topic in the first century. Why? Why is it such a big deal for New Testament churches? Because in that culture, widows were the most marginalized people within the community and within the church, right? There's no social safety net in the first century. There's no social security. There's no life insurance. There's no 401k that can meet the needs of a widow if her husband dies. In fact, she was completely dependent on either another male relative, if she was young, maybe back into her father's house, or a brother, or a brother-in-law, or an uncle. Remember we saw back in Ruth, that kinsman redeemer, Boaz? Okay, so they were marginalized and in danger of slipping through the cracks. Well, see, I think it's a safe assumption to take these principles about how the church should treat widows and apply it, yes, to widows in our church, but also to other members of the church family who are marginalized, who are falling through the cracks, who are overlooked. In fact, I think one of the best ways for the church to protect and reflect the gospel message is in how we treat the marginalized. You don't believe me? Look at what James, the brother of Jesus, writes. Mr. Practical James, James 1.27. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, the marginalized, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So here's what I'm saying. As we walk through and unpack, some of Paul's instructions about how the church should take care of widows, I think we need to apply those principles to how we as a church treat the marginalized, not just outside our church, but starting inside our church. Now, like I said earlier, you can't just cut and paste these, you know, verse 3 through 16 and drag it across culture and time and say, all right, this is our policy for marginalized people, exactly as Paul wrote it to Timothy. But there are some principles, two principles that I find. You may find more when you're digging in there, but there are two that jumped off the page at me. And interestingly, both of these principles of how we as a church treat the marginalized, both are built on this idea of ensuring That when the church provides help to people in need, it is truly helping. That we're not solving a short-term issue and at the same time creating a a long-term bigger problem. That we're not doing something that looks like we're helping now, but in the long run is actually making it worse for them. Because I think as most of us know, There are times when you can do something for somebody that seems like you're helping, but in reality, you're actually hurting 
them. Maybe you're financing it or you're assisting them to continue to make bad choices and to damage their life. So these two principles, write these down when it comes to relating to each other in a way that helps us truly help the marginalized. Principle number one, assistance begins at home. Assistance begins at home. God's design is that the first line of defense for meeting the needs of the marginalized are the biological family members. Notice he says this in verse 4 and in verse 8. Check it out. He says, but if a widow has children and grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents. I like that part. Paying, repaying, yeah. Uh, For this is pleasing to God. So it's got to start with the family. In fact, look at what he says in verse 8. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household They've denied the faith, and it is worse than an unbeliever. So you're not only helping the marginalized, but you're also helping the family not to shirk their biblical Christian responsibility to care for their own relatives. To say, well, yeah, we can help them out, but the church has got plenty of money. Let's pawn them off on the church. And maybe the church does have, but that allows the family to dishonor God by choosing not to honor their mothers, their fathers, their grandfathers. It starts at home. Second principle, jot this down. Assistance from the church is relational, not institutional. Let me say that again. Assistance is relational, not institutional. What I mean by that is when the church assists someone in need, Unlike how the government does it, it is not a one-size-fits-all. You understand, government assistance is a kind of a, they have these rules and regulations, this is the bureaucracy, these are the things you got to meet in order to get assistance, and it's a one-size-fits-all. The problem is not everybody in need is the same. Assisting people in need always works best in the context of relationship, not bureaucracy. Let me say that again. Assisting the marginalized is always more helpful and effective when it's done in the context of a relationship versus a government or a bureaucracy. Paul puts it this way, verse 5 and 6. The widow who is really in need and left all alone, she puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. But... The widow who lives for pleasure is dead even while she lives. Do you see what Paul is saying? Not all widows are the same. They may meet the qualifications like Paul says. They need to be over 60 before they get on the church list. They have to have all this stuff. They may meet the bureaucratic list and qualifications, but they're not all the same. They're living different lives. And that matters in how you assist them, right? If you give financial support to someone who is living for their own pleasure, what are they going to do with that money? Right? They're going to use it for their own pleasure. And Paul says, that's a dead end. We are financing them living in this empty, purposeless, self-absorbed life. Don't do that, church. Not because they're bad people and they don't deserve help. It's because it's not really helping them. It's financing their own destruction. But if you give financial resources, church, to a widow or a marginalized person who is glorifying God in every area of their life, what do you think they're going to do with that assistance? They're going to glorify God with it. But here's the thing. The only way to know is if someone in the church is in relationship with that person in need. Right, Because they can look the same on the outside. You can't really tell by passing them on Sunday morning and goes, oh, they're living a godly life. Oh, they're living for pleasure. No, somebody from within the church needs to be in relationship so we know how to help in a way that truly helps. 
That's why, in case you don't know, when we as a church, you and us as leaders on your behalf, when we provide financial assistance, if that person is outside the church or not a part of our church or somebody in the community that has need, we connect them with one of our local partners that helps people in need, Acts, Christ, Christ Central, Christian Ministries, Megiddo Dream Station. Why? Because they enter in a relationship with that individual. They look at the family, the resources, what do they get, and they get in a relationship with them. That's the best way to make sure the help is really helping. Now, when somebody is a part of the church family and needs financial assistance, we just make sure if they're not already connected, we want to connect them relationally with the church to make sure they got a home group that's walking with them to connect them with care and counseling, celebrate recovery, or one of our financial counselors who can look at their budget, their money, their expenditures that can truly help them. Because most of the time, you guys know this, the source of most money problems is not a money problem. It's, it's rarely a lack of finances. It's almost always, not all the time, but it's almost always other things in their life that they need help getting in balance and in line, and then the money stuff takes care of itself. Now, please listen to me. Listen to me. I am not saying if you need financial assistance from the church, you're a bad person who's not making good decisions. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that when it comes to the church helping the marginalized, we need to make sure that we're truly helping and not making things worse. And that only happens in the context of relationship. And then finally, number three, the third principle Paul tells us about how we as a church should relate to each other in the family is these relations have to be built to reflect equality. They have to be built to reflect equality. Now, I know equality is a word that's getting thrown around a whole lot in our culture. And, of course, now the big buzzword is equity. That's what everybody's talking about. But what do I mean when I say church relationships have to reflect equality? What do I mean by that? Well, I'll let Paul answer the question. Look at verse 21. Paul says, I charge you, he's talking to Timothy, I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels, to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. Now remember, Paul's talking about how we treat each other, not how we treat people outside the church, but how we treat each other inside the church, how we relate to each other as brothers and sisters. And what that means is that we look at brothers and sisters in Christ through the lens of their God-given worth and value. Not the color of their skin or their political persuasion or their demographic or their financial status. We see each other through the God-given worth and value that everybody matters. So how does this get played out practically? Well, again, let's look at Mr. Practical James, James 2. James says, in the church, he's talking to the church, if you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but you say to the poor man, you stand there or you sit at the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Favoritism and prejudice are two sides of the same coin. You know what prejudice and favoritism have in common? They're both 100% centered on me. Well, how I look at people based on what they can do for me or what I don't think they can do for me. And when I look at people through that lens, I am no longer protecting or reflecting the gospel of Jesus. That's the exact opposite of the gospel of Jesus. See, that's the one thing we all have in common. <laughs> Rich, poor, black and white, brown, Republican, Democrat, independent. The one thing we all have in common is we had to come to the cross with nothing in our hands. We were all equal at the foot of the cross. 
And we brought nothing of value for our salvation. And we were given more than we could have earned at that moment and more than we will ever earn over the length of our life on this earth. We are all equal there and we protect and reflect the gospel by coming empty-handed into our relationships with each other. That's what relationships, brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, that's what the church is supposed to look like. So let me close where I started, again, bringing us back to the ultimate purpose of the church. Again, 1 Timothy 1.5. The aim of our charge, Cedar Creek, our goal, the heart, the reason we exist is love. Love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. And that's the kind of church family I want to be a part of. And that's the kind of church family I'm so thankful Cedar Creek is. And that's what I want us to continue to be as we keep moving wherever God takes us in the future. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you for just revealing the truths of your word in practical, relevant ways. And Father, I stand before you and before these people that I love and care for, this family that you've blessed us to be a part of, and freely admit that on my own, on my best day, I can't live up to that standard. I still struggle to see people through my human lens and experiences. I still struggle with my codependency to want to just do the quick fix to help people instead of caring enough to connect relationally and make sure it's true help. I struggle to honor and respect everyone. And so, Lord, I recognize I have to come to your cross empty-handed and beg for you to fill me with your spirit. So, God, would you do that for us? Would you just pour out your spirit right now across this congregation, across those who are watching online? Would you move in that way and help us to be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word, that we would all take a next step, whatever that is, that each of us has a next step in living out this truth of how we relate to each other in the church. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you in advance that we get to be a part of your kingdom. It's in your name I pray. Amen.